All righty, it is 12.16, let's get going. Keep on that military time. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. My name is Jennifer Cunningham. I'm the Associate Vice President of Alumni Relations here at Lehigh and the facilitator of these Mountain Talks. Um, today we have a fascinating discussion from Dr. Ahmed Rahman, um, who is a associate professor and the program director of the College of Business at Lehigh and a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics. We're going to talk today about moneyballing and the military. I assume a lot of you, if you didn't see the movie, uh, are familiar with the term about uh, data. And so he's going to be talking us through some of the data um, analysis that he's done and what it might mean for us in the future. So a uh, couple housekeeping things. We are recording this. So if you have to drop off early or you want to recommend it to a friend, we'll send you a link in a few days with the recording. Uh, part of the beauty of these webinars is that it's interactive. So uh, Ahmed will speak for about 15 minutes and then uh, you will have a chance to ask your questions and make your comments through the chat, which is probably on the bottom of your screen. You just click that little cartoon. And if you want just um, myself and Ahmed to see your comments and questions, then uh, you can choose host. If you would like the entire group to see it, please choose everyone. I prefer that because it makes things more interesting when you start connecting amongst yourselves. Um, and I will be reading the questions to Ahmed so he can focus on giving the answers instead of reading the little chat box. All right, with that, let's get going. Dr. Raman. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jennifer. We appreciate the opportunity here and welcome everybody. I appreciate your time. Uh, just coming off the heels of a wonderful graduation ceremony this weekend. So it's very nice to uh, transition a little bit to the summer and discuss, yes, money balling the military. So let's just get right into it. And uh, first of all, I suppose, so, uh, Jennifer, thank you for kind of contextualizing here. If it helps you guys, just think of me as an Indian grad fit. Okay, so I hope that, that that'll, that'll be a smooth transition. And right here we have money ball. Um, what is it? Well, it's simply a management approach of using data to, you know, do baseball better under, you know, identifying talents, uh, of maximizing efficiency, stuff that economists kind of like. And of course, um, you know, there's um, wonderful insights here that helps uh, with baseball. Um, a little bit unclear how these management practices can kind of spill over into other modes of, of operation. And that's where our work comes into play when it comes to, as I'm calling money balling the military, what does that mean? Well, one is we're looking at military data, military operations, um, but also looking at it from a human capital perspective. Uh, human capital simply means skills, training, uh, knowledge and experience that's gonna help you, me, or anyone who has this human capital perform our jobs better, our lot, you know, have better lives uh, and so on. So we do this by educating people, you know, in college uh, or K through 12, we try to instill leadership skills in people. So uh, we try to, uh, you know, instill in people a sense of determination and grit and resilience in the context when, when um, negative concept, negative outcomes uh, happen. How do you deal with that? Uh, and then, you know, we also want to retain all those wonderful skills once we develop them. But between you and me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have to admit that I think we are currently in a little bit of a human capital uh, deficit. Uh, something of a crisis is uh, is underway. We are not particularly good at educating our, our, uh, our college students. Uh, Lehigh is great. Don't get me wrong. Lehigh is, we're doing it great. Everywhere else, not so great. So uh, what I'm suggesting here is by looking at um, the human capital aspects in military data, military operations, we can learn how to do things sort of all, you know, in all uh, realms of life, right? We have to acknowledge that uh, developing those skills, developing human capital uh, is hard. Okay? It requires investment. It requires time, it requires money. Um, and military training is also very hard and requires a similar kind of investment. So what we're trying to accomplish here with this broad research agenda right, is this data-driven approach, uh, looking specifically at naval uh, data that spans about a century and a half, right? And so we're in the process of digitizing. We have digitized huge amounts of information We've written a number of papers, um, but I, I wanted to just at this point provide us a, a bit of a broad overview of why any of this might matter. And we think from the management perspective of thinking about 
um, developing and retaining individuals, whether you run a business, whether you run a, a profit or not for profit organization, whether you run a book club, it doesn't really matter. How can we do things better? Can the military provide us any guidance here? So this is where the, we got this naval economic kind of analysis, I like to, um, to call it. And we like military data, not necessarily because we're, we're, we're um, sort of, you know, wed to all things military, but there's three basic ideas here. One is there's a lot of it. So we like data because there's a lot of a rich assortment of information. Um, there's also as information on exactly what we're interested in, human capital, how to educate and train personnel, right? And the third and possibly the most important reason, especially for me as a social scientist, is that there's just a lot of stuff that happens in the military that's random. So academics like me like random stuff because it creates these so-called natural experiments. Uh, random war, random peace, random deployments, uh, a new random technology that suddenly we have to all become accustomed to, uh, and so on. All these sorts of shocks can allow us to explore with this data and, and uh, analytical approach, how uh, one might better develop skills and training and, and keep those skills in the, in the organization, right? So that's sort of the big picture. I'm gonna step back just before we get into the specifics of human capital uh, and, and the specific work and think a little bit about um, one of the first trade-offs that you might've seen in your EPO one days, right? Whether you had Frank Gunther or Richard Aronson beforehand, depending on your cohort, one of the big trade-offs in society is about guns versus butter. They don't literally mean guns, they don't literally mean butter, of course. Uh, what we mean is this um, guns as a representation of national security and butter as a representation, of course, of economic prosperity. And we need to, of course, stress that you can't have everything. So if you want about more of one, you've got to give up some of the other. And that negative association is depicted here with this curvy line. Um, and what we're noticing, of course, is many societies, particularly today, um, is now transitioning a little bit for away from the economic prosperity in order to secure uh, security, right? And we might lament this a bit because that means, oh, we're lacking our, you know, we're, we're giving up something. We're giving up comfort. We're, uh, we're giving up the economic prosperity that we, 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 we all strive for. Um, but if you believe this discussion, um, and you know, uh, we'll go into detail a little bit more soon about human capital and learning from focusing on military operations or devoting more resources to military operations. Is it possible that we can develop skills and training and expertise for all of society so that we potentially are able to produce more of both over time, right? We get more prosperity and security. Now, of course, if you find that a ludicrous uh, and, you know, and I agree, it's like, well, that sounds rather jingoistic, right? That seems excessively militaristic. Um, if we replace the guns, the military side with capitalism and the butter with consumption, which you can see in some economic models, then this might make a little bit more sense, right? Like a capital good is something you're developing for the betterment of society in the future, even though it takes time to develop now and it's actually really painful to develop now. Might there be in the human capital development in military, some element of this capital good that can actually spill over right, into prosperity in a broader sense. So that is the idea. Again, you should remain very skeptical, but as we go through this, maybe we could think a little bit of the possibilities here of thinking of military as more like a human capital kind of good. Right? That transition was happening in the United States, of course, for the century and a half that, um, that we focus on. Here, just measuring in terms of shifts, uh, in the late 19th century, the U.S. kind of, you know, lagged behind, but due to exigencies in, in, the, in the world, uh, climbed to sort of second place, I guess, relative to the United Kingdom uh, in terms of Navy. And then a few decades later, of course, overtook uh, the United Kingdom, right? So this process of shifting from point A to point B, from guns, uh, from butter to guns, is certainly something that uh, we in this country have seen over the course of many, many decades. In the process of that, what we've done is sort of created what I want to call floating firms. Uh, these are naval organizational units that are literally floating out there with personnel, with technology, with capital, with hierarchies, with, with goals, with personnel that might get promoted or not, that are being evaluated on a constant uh, basis on all kinds of hard and soft skills. So this is what we're talking about when it comes to learning about how to do things more effectively whether it's a company or, or, or anything, 
uh, by looking at the intricacies of these floating parts, right? Uh, so in the process of doing that, here's what we do. We document uh, like thousands of these sorts of pages. Computers help us, but there's a lot of physical, just kind of personal doing this, right? So this is a list of commanders um, and like maybe their stations. Um, so we, we document things like this. We document things like the pay of these officers, uh, lots of this information is available at uh, in the archives, either in Washington uh, or my old institution at the U.S. Naval Academy, or in fact, um, many other uh, sources uh, around um, the country. And we link these also with census records, right? So actually understand in terms of military service. So then what do you do with that once we uh, leave military service if you, if you do? So the four areas, okay, that I'd like to spend the remainder of our, our brief time here uh, talking about is the education, the leadership, the grit, and the retention, uh, or uh, L, yeah, that's not, how about LERG? No, GLER? No, all right, so we, we can talk later maybe in the Q&A about the proper acronym, but certainly uh, education leadership will probably get to, and then if we have time, or maybe in the q we can talk a little bit more about how to instill grits from people and how to retain personnel. So the first one, I'm gonna go in order here, so education, personnel, leadership. How can we improve higher education one thing is, we, I think um, a big chunk, you've heard about this uh, uh, student loan uh, sort of crisis, right? Uh, student debt is uh, off the charts. Part of the reason has been argued is the lack of preparedness of college students. When they come to college, they're actually not pretty ill-equipped already. So what the military is really interested, uh, uh, good at is, or potentially good at, is developing programs and training programs to actually get people up to speed, right? So in the service academies in our country, you've got, they, they each have, uh, you know, Army, uh, you know, West Point and the Air Force and, and Navy all have these preparatory programs. So we delve into the Navy's preparatory program, uh, which where students who apply to the Naval Academy are actually sometimes selected for this one year pre-college program. Uh, you can imagine that that's going to be selection there because those students who are deemed to be struggling, they're the ones who, who um, will get selected. So it might be hard to actually pull out the effect. But they also tend to come from very competitive uh, congressional districts. And that is part of that random thing that we can explore to see how, how effective a program like, like the, the, the NAPS program is. Turns out it's not really that effective. <laughs> so we can talk more in the Q&A if we want more details of why that is. But a little bit, okay, we have lots of these programs to try to bring people up to speed. And there's lots of failure here, at least in the context here in the, uh, uh, in, in the military. Uh, and we, we still some work to be done. A little bit more promising, I would have to say, is the power of your peer, right? So I know as an instructor at the Naval Academy that I hope I have an effect on my students, but I know that they have an effect on each other. And sometimes good, sometimes not so good. So this peer effects is really important in terms of performance, in education, performance in, in, um, in, in the company, and so on. So I promise only one equation. Here's my just one equation I'm just gonna throw out as a sort of a, as a benchmark of what we might do. So on the left-hand side is G. G is simply like your performance, okay? So here it might be a grade in school. It could be an evaluation from your boss. The person's eyes performance in some environment C during year T. It could be a semester, if it's a class, if it's a class. Z, the thing on the right-hand side, are your own abilities or your own attributes? It could be your SAT scores. It could be the income that your parents made. Uh, you know, it could be the neighborhood in which you, you live. All these kinds of personal and background traits, which we know is going to be really important for your performance. But on top of that, the person's, um, you know, your peer group, they're going to have uh, that's that Z bar. That's going to be very important uh, as well potentially. And so we're interested in that gamma. That gamma term is the is the estimate that we want to pull out to see to understand how important your peers are to your performance. The nice thing about the military, again, maybe not so so nice for people who are serving, <laughs> but for those of us who are scientists looking at it, there's a lot of random assignments, right? So you really cannot pick your classmates if you're at the service academy. You can't pick your workmates if you're in a company or your shipmates, uh, your or your company mates where you live. And so each of these allows us to sort of pull out the peer spillover. So this is the work that we're doing. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the leadership stuff. But um, if there is interest, if there, we want to talk about uh, what we find in these peer effect literature, I'm very happy to talk about it. 
or even more um, shamelessly promote some of my papers by uh, by uh, but maybe later. So that's the, on the education side, which I think there's great promise here in the military human capital. What about leadership? This is the key in many respects, right? What makes an effective leader? So I have an answer. If you want to, you want to come focus. You can, you can tell you, 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 the answer is um, we don't know. <laughs> no one knows. No one knows what makes an effective leader. I just want to stress that very strongly. Uh, people say they know. Uh, uh, we, but a lot of this stuff is based on conjecture. A lot of it is based on anecdotes. And that, from a money balling perspective, is not good. Enough. You can get characteristics of leadership. That's great. You can get even smaller characteristics, the three C's. This is good. Actually, this comes from this. I don't know if you know, that's a Navy thing, right? Turning the ship around, a very popular book on leadership. It's a very powerful idea, especially that you need all three. And actually, uh, Captain here suggests that if you don't have all three, only two, then you might be a dangerous leader or a myopic leader or an enchained leader. <laughs> um, but again, really insightful stuff. Um, potentially very helpful, but all based on anecdotes and conjecture. And of course, based on that personal perspective and all the inherent biases, in, you know, natural to such a perspective. So again, the data, but very hard to do. What we have in leadership is, of course, lots of wonderful quotes, lots of vision, lots of posters on the wall with hats dangling or whatever. Uh, but what does make effective leadership is um, is really hard. Um, we're we have worked on this. We're pouring over it now. Um, what makes for the secure, like officers, right? In the context of an officer, where there's a real clear hierarchical chain of command. Um, so a couple of things. I just want to. I'll just show um, a couple of quick data points here, um, which actually makes the challenge that much more clear. Which is here we have data on the relationship between officers. Let's say success during the Second World War. Again, as I said, we're we're going we're going back in time, right? Uh, and uh, measured either as command number of days command at sea during during war, or the number of decorations you're awarded uh, during during the war. And then we correlate that with your or overall order of merit. But all these individuals are Naval Academy graduates, and so as a result, they have this sort of order of merit, like based on our uh, performance, academic performance in the academy. And here you go, no relationship at all. So obviously, we need to go way more beyond things like GPA or SAT or any like these basic quantitative scores, because that, as we all know, is not going to pull out those nebulous leadership problems. Anyone who knows John McCain's biography might not be surprised by this picture at all. What about more contemporaneous kind of things? Well, here we have um, uh, you know, a situation where we have uh, officers from the last 30 years, and they're always being ranked. Like I said, we like military data because there's so much of it. So every six months, they get evaluated you know, based on these various uh, criteria. So leadership is this thing in red here. And as you can know, as you notice, those who survive up to captain tend to have higher leadership qualities, those up vertical, that's higher ability. But of course, they have higher ability in all kinds of areas, right? Not just leadership, they're more professional, they have better teamwork ability, they have a military characteristic, and, and so on. So again, unclear, we, we kind of had to tease out the actual leadership fortune from, from, from the rest. Maybe the final thing I'll, 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 I'll talk about, and then we might talk about it later, we can open it up to the Q&A, is a slightly different approach, which is um, these more qualitative information. So these are lucky bags. Lucky bags are every our annual yearbooks that the Naval Academy produces, okay? So it's a college thing. And what happens is in every page are uh, two individuals, they're roommates. Now remember, the roommates are randomly assigned. So we have two people who have been thrust together to live with each other for four years. At the end of the four years, they are asked to write a biography about the other individual, right? So I just grabbed somebody from, from a page from 1905. So we got John Newton, who comes from uh, Carbondale, uh, uh, straight up north uh, from Lehigh. And then we have Chester Nimitz, right? There's two random people I just kind of grabbed. And we have the biography, biographical information from the other person, so, you know, John here uh, was described as bluffing his way through three years and sucking it heavily ever since. I don't even know what these words mean. This is 1905 student, but okay, fine. That's that individual's uh, biography. And then Chester uh, has a biography that calm and steady going Dutch way and so on. Again, not clear exactly what these things are, are suggesting. So I wanted to get a little bit of help 
And so just like many of you, I'm fascinated with this chat GPT stuff. So I, I throw it in there, right? And I, and I say, all right, based on the following biography, we're in an early 20th century language. I told that you could do this. Can you tell me if this person would be a better worker or a better leader? Right? This is a, a test case. And so when I threw in John's, uh, chat GPT said, oh, a work. Okay, and give, gives lots of information why. When I give Chester's, uh, Chat GPT immediately said, oh no, this person actually seems to have leadership possibility. And here's the reason why, right? So again, I'm not saying we're going to be using Chat GPT, but what we are doing is collecting like thousands of these biographies and then doing textual analysis to try to understand, pull out those key qualities that have nothing to do with grades, nothing to do, but other softer skills or other things that might relate to, right, the kind of uh, leadership approach. It turns out, at least in this case, um, Chat GPT was kind of on the money, right? I don't know what happened to John, but I do know Chester had a pretty decent naval career. Uh, and so as a result, this study seems a little bit promising, right? Uh, after that. Yeah, so those are two kind of examples. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if we have time to talk about maybe one more thing here, which would be... Uh, uh, Sure. What one more thing, and then um, while you're talking about that, if people want to think about the questions or comments they want to make, they can put those in the chat, and then we'll get to questions right after how we impart grit. <laughs> All right, excellent. And again, this is also something to do with leadership, and and you know, just but but we know that um, such a critical element of of uh, of human capital, right? Um, and so, of course, I, I don't know if people know Angela Duckworth. She's done a tremendous amount of work here. Uh, in the psychology aspects here, of trying to determine what are these attributes that was, relates to grit. Again, though, a lot of work needs to be done in terms of understanding, even if we know what the, what the attributes are, how do we instill it in people? And that's where I think there, there's a lot of um, room here to grow and think about this in the, from the money-balling kind of perspective. I will, and I will just mention this one picture here, which uh, is a paper that we've done when it comes to my old alma uh, place that I worked at, the Naval Academy, as I mentioned, uh, where we have, again, these students, they don't get to choose their instructors. And so what happens is if they have a relatively easy instructor or a, you know, a, a popular instructor for their first semester, they, their grades might do quite well. But what happens in the second semester? So this horizontal line is, um, you know, or, or sorry, vertical line is the GPA, what they get in the second semester. And then, but we're looking at what happened to them in the first semester. And it turns out, if you have a tough professor, someone who, who imparts a hard skill, or someone that actually maybe uh, students don't really like because we have their student evaluation, uh, those students do better on the second time, right? So if you had a hard Calc 1 instructor, you should do better in Calc 2, again, okay, on average. Uh, but if you had a, uh, what we call maybe a soft instructor, someone like they really like them, that, that individual a lot, who gives out lots of uh, high grades, uh, your performance deteriorates pretty remarkably. Uh, that's the green dotted line going, going down. Um, and so that's, well, how is this related to grit? Well, we can actually correlate that, these changes with other attributes of the student, right? We have a lot of background information. We have a lot of like personality tests and things of this nature. So we can pull out lots of these things that again, try to understand, maybe augment what Angela has been doing here, of what are these attributes that are associated with the ability um, to, you know, not just like handle a, a negative shock, but bounce back, that resilience that people like uh, Jonathan Pete and others have been talking about sort of uh, regard, be the flame, you know, or whatever, the things that will make you more resilient. Um, so we think there's lots of negative or, or, you know, adverse things that happen to you in the military. What can we learn about career that we can pull out in the, in the civilian So, um, yeah, that's kind of what so I'm gonna I'll skip over the retention stuff and simply end on this idea that you know we have this human capital. Uh, it's shaped in uh, like one area, the American Navy. Uh, it's it allowed the United States to become um, a leader in the world. I'm not saying that we want to focus on military operations to continue that leadership. In fact, the military is not really maybe very good at lots of this stuff. Right? It's not like we're we're trying to emulate them. What we're trying to do is learn from them what works, but also what does not. Work. And that's what I mean from learning from our history, uh, supporting the uh, sort of the history here and digitization of records and, and documenting this so that we can do this analytical research, I think is very important and very uh, very strategic. And, and oh, that's like for provided. Thanks so much. Your hate mail can be sent to the uh, ASR. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much.
Um, first, are, will you share your presentation with the, um, can we email that to attendees? Absolutely. Okay. Very happy um, to do that, yeah. Okay, someone was asking specifically about okay, the diagram. Okay, because there's a lot of, <laughs> and yeah. I went relatively quickly, so apologies for the for the speed. Um, I'm very happy to share all the slides. Fantastic. Okay, Veronica's question. What are the most interesting examples of leadership you've found? For example, a quiet and not really outspoken person has been successful as a higher up. And can yeah. I just add on to Veronica's thing? and ask you about, um, obviously a lot of the naval history would be male leaders. And a, I was wondering how you account for the uh, female, typical female leadership style. No, that's great. Actually, let's go backwards and say that. So, uh, you know, the female, enroll, uh, you know, either enrollment in the, in, in the service academies, enrollment in, in, in military service has been slow, has been arduous. Uh, we've made tremendous strides. Uh, but there is also a great exploration of what leadership means in the context of such imbalance, let's just say. Uh, being at the academy, I would notice uh, leadership pop up all the time when it comes to just even the classroom dynamic. If I, I, I would also say that, like, so in a classroom of 18, and actually a lot of you in the audience might have similar remembrances of imbalance like this. In a classroom of 18, I would have one female uh, midshipman, and uh, usually that was not. Um, I would that would be great for her, I guess. Uh, right? If there was a critical mass of two or three, it would actually be enough to, I guess, tame the negative behavior of some of the other more rambunctious male uh, students in in the room. Uh, it would take. So part of leadership, actually, is, you know, we sometimes think of this as an individual trait. The context really matters. And I think that's also important for managers. Like if you're gonna create a, a team, what does that team look like? And and like leading, learning how to lead is also just knowing what like, you know, what 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 should the team group look like? How should go, go, how should my underlings interact with each other or with me? Uh so that again, just I'm a civilian through and through, but I learned quite a lot uh just being through the, the, the academy in terms of uh those ideas uh of of, of leadership. And again, if this is where my anecdotes, like I said, I, I just make fun of people with their anecdotes. I am my own anecdote. Mm -hmm. uh, what we really do need is to pour much more deeply and to see if those anecdotes are in are emblematic of a more general idea, or is it just a wrong? And again, I think, uh, yeah, so there's many types of traits. Sometimes they're hard to quantify, but people don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have several questions here, so um, let me get to Eric's question. Have you found good leaders leadership translating into protective resilience for mental health conditions for those under a leader's charge? Yeah, I wonder, did the Navy even keep records of that? Yeah, no, so great. That's like the leadership and the grit kind of combining. Like, mm -hmm. as a leader, how do you actually instill that degree of, pers of perseverance? Um, no, So, you know, as one example, another example that I guess um, we, we didn't, I didn't bring up, there is a physical requirement, as you might guess, in, in military service. Uh, if you're at the Navy, if you, you have to, you know, so I remember at the Naval Academy, you have to run a mile and a half in 10 minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, uh, that wasn't so daunting for me back when I was there, but now it's like, wow, I think it's like, but, but um, so if you fall behind that, you have to do that like once every six months. Um, then what occurs is you have to then, you're under remediation. Right. So now you have to do a lot more physical work. Uh, you have to get up earlier. You have to train more. But you're doing it in the middle of the semester when you're balancing all the academic stuff as well. So um, we is, at the academy did a little bit of some analysis of, of this and what approaches uh, we can do. So we have some, it's a little bit more, it's involved. I'm very happy to maybe share uh, more details in, uh, in the document if the person who asked would like to follow up. Uh, but in general, it's sort of this combination of being able to balance that physical reality of uh, this is so difficult um, with the academic side. Uh, and we're able to pull off some of these basic uh, uh, traits. I, I guess you can call that a, a form of grit because you are bouncing back from a negative uh, mm -hmm. consequence. But but we have cases where they some never bounce back. Uh, they are actually always behind their, their academic performance slides down and kind of remains something we really need to be aware of. Uh, not just in the military. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, we have 
probably 10 questions. So okay. I, I might deeper. ask you to do more of a rapid fire. Sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> and they're, they're really good questions. Um, Gordon is asking, this is interesting, what does the data predict about Senator Tuberville's hold on military promotions? Fantastic question. Now, we wrote a paper on this exact same thing when it was happening um, because of the potentially dire consequences. I actually have an elasticity estimate. I don't have it in front of me, but I actually have the, you know, a, a month's delay, okay, a month's delay of not getting that promotion. You know, it's it's for, it's not just for on pay, right? right? It's the disruption that that comes from that. And so the punchline there, I'm sorry, I know, I know you told me to, it's bad. <laughs> That's my short answer. It's bad. We actually quantified just how bad, um, but it's not great because there was a lot of, yeah, so. Yeah. So the next question, or I'm going to um, jump down to Stan's question to ask, is the Navy receptive to your work? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, to a degree. So ultimately what we, you know, our, the reception that we get is we're always asking them for more data and we have great partnerships. Uh, that being said, I presented this work last year at Whitehall and the uh, Ministry of Defense in England. They seem really receptive. They were like really interested in kind of doing this. And then we're going to go to Rome kind of soon for the, the Ministry of Defense there. So it seems that um, other, yeah, there there is uh, there is receptiveness that's happening uh, slowly but surely. We're, I'm very happy just to be an obscure uh, uh, economist and academic uh, doing this stuff. But, uh, you know, because again, the, the, the objective is not necessarily to enhance military operations. It's sort of to enhance just kind of business mm -hmm, overall. Right. Uh, but I was scared to do that. Right. Interesting. Okay, back to... Um... To Hunt, Hunt's question, how do you see the zero defect culture of the 90s military returning and decreasing the talent pool? I'm not sure what that means, but maybe you do. Yeah, no, I actually, so uh, ultimately, I think, so, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting, we have lots of, the vicissitudes of, of, of the Navy has these cycles. So the nice thing about going 150 years, right, is that you have shocks, let's say negative consequences of something that happens in the 80s or 90s, and those reverberate kind of down. So we haven't explicitly tested, you know, something that happened, let's say in the mid nineties, uh, that then kind of translates into military operation, the military effectiveness or lack thereof decades later. Uh, but there are, these are the kinds of questions. So so if the if the questioner could actually lay out a little bit more detail about that, as would that be a potential exogenous shock or some grand a variation that we could use to understand uh the questions that we're asking how yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, Frank Gunter. He has a question here. Oh my God, um, I Frank. <laughs> so, um, unlike many civilian jobs, there is little competition for promotion at the lower ranks. Unless one really screws up, one will be promoted to 02, 03, and usually 04 just by staying alive. <laughs> Since junior officers know that they are not competing with each other for a promotion, does this encourage cooperation? And could similar promotion policies be used for civilians? What a great question. Of course, yeah. I didn't expect France to ask this, uh, such a thing. That's absolutely true. The first rank, it's it's sort of, and and you do see uh, all kinds of, and this is part of the reason why this camaraderie, partnership, uh, collaborative spirit is all very, very important, both in the service academies and in the early uh, training of, of military personnel. The trick comes later when the pipeline starts to narrow. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of thing that we're, you know, when I talk about retention, the fourth study that we can talk about, uh, that's the area that we're exploiting, right? Uh, but it is very interesting. Again, context matters. So again, organizing, you know, in our world of education, we talk about bell curves. We talk about, well, bell curves. we talk about curving grades. Be careful because when you create situations of curving grades, you're creating a potential competitive environment. Uh, that might uh, go against your uh, uh, interest of, of creating that collaboration. So we do see evidence of that collaborative element. We haven't really done anything academically or empirically, uh, but this is where I love having Frank as a colleague because he can, he can always tell me things that we should be working on. So mm -hmm. thank you, Frank. Yeah. Um, Eric's question, ROTC seems like a money ball approach to officer training, cheap, random, et cetera, compared to the academies but the academy grads still seem to dominate at the general and flag officer grades. Why is that? That's, uh, yeah. Um, so I have mixed feelings about this. Again, anecdote, right? So I could talk about, I don't have the data uh, because we're, we're, we, we don't have, we haven't poured over the ROTC groups or officer candidacy schools, right? There are other approaches. Um, 
What I can say is the academy and all the service academies pride themselves on the holistic education, mm -hmm. right? That it's not just um, the training that you can get from ROTC, and it's not just the education that you get from the college in which the ROTC is located. It's the synthesis of the two. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an ongoing debate. Um, uh, I voted with my feet and came to Lehigh for many, many very great reasons. Like Lehigh is amazing. Uh, the academy is a different environment, also amazing, but um, different. And so we, you know, we go back and forth in terms of is there real? What is that value add? I think the mil the service academies can do things way better with certain things, and I'm not sure the hierarchical uh, approach is the right approach for academics um, and education overall. But the argument, again, from that perspective, is yes, we're exploiting lots of complementarities. Mm -hmm. So that would be the argument. I'm not 100% sure I share that argument, but that is definitely not right. Yep. Uh, Valerie asks, I think I heard you say that the NAP program has been a failure. Could you explain this further and define failure? Yeah, so um, basically what we find is the NAPS people, the, the people who do the pre-college program, they don't actually, um, they do graduate in four years. So graduation rates are comparable uh, with people who don't go to NAPS. And so it looks like there is a, maybe a little bit of a boost up in terms of graduation rates. But in terms of grades or in terms of uh, academic performance, there doesn't seem to be a lot there. Ultimately, what it is, is making sure that people can pass. They can pass through the doors. Um, and so again, in terms of operations, I think um, especially, and maybe heard retention is a kind of a problem in the military as it kind of is in lots of areas. Um, if the goal is to get people through the door, then I think the NAP program can be considered something of a success. But if the if the if it is to actually increase the human capital, human capability of those, then it is not. And this goes back to the idea of what is it that we're doing through education? Are we simply handing out degrees? and credentialing people, mm -hmm. or are we giving actual human capital? And I think our NAPS paper, our NAPS study demonstrates that you can do the first one and still call it success. But we call out a little bit like, well, all right, but if we actually think of ed education and instructors of knowledge, not intelligent. So that's what we mean when we say it's not an abject failure, but from that perspective, we think it's not working very well. And that's just for officer training, not for enlisted, right? And that's for the officer side. Of okay. Right. Okay. Um, Gordon's question, uh, what does the data show about racial diversity or racial bias in military leadership? Excellent. Um, so I think the, the there are lots of work. Now, I don't have work on, on this. Um, there is work on when you have integrated uh, four. Uh, you have uh, that sticks. So the first, so the Korean War, I think, the first time we had this integration of, of army troops, mm -hmm. and so we have studies that you can see uh, soldiers who actually are with uh, white soldiers who are now integrated with black uh, soldiers. Uh, they tend to have more black friends later in life. They tend to potentially marry racially later in life. They actually maybe even uh, perform better as, as socioeconomically later in life. So again, there is um, hopeful evidence to suggest that this, uh, you know, we have episodes of integration that we can exploit to see what, you know, what areas in the economy do we still face these sorts of barriers to entry? We face massive asymmetries in terms of the, the um, of, you know, personnel. And again, military being a little bit of a laggard potentially in some ways, uh, we have the data to actually pull out precisely how these interactions with peers of different race or different background and impact you. So the research is hopeful and we continue to explore that. Mm, okay. Um, Clark asks, did your leadership training include leader behavior flexibility? In other words, the idea that a leader should adopt leadership style after analyzing the situation in which they find themselves. Yeah, I, I think that is actually, that is the, the point that's I think what I'm sorry I'm just gonna go back that is the point of okay it's not one of these uh but sort of flexibility uh to the extent to which you can change behavior uh so I, the the short answer is we haven't done anything we haven't done anything that 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 is a little bit of the maybe that's a little bit related to the grit thing which is suddenly something un, unforeseen has occurred how do we adjust and as I mentioned you know this. We're, we're still accumulating lots of data, we're still accumulating, and we're still doing the analysis, but we think there's gonna be lots of opportunities here you know, uh, to test those leadership uh, ideas. Um, sudden change and flexibility of mind, like a flexible mindset. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not good. When is it good? When you stick to your gun, so to speak, and just 
proceed ahead. Stick to your butter. Stick to your uh, butter. <laughs> <laughs> In your example of hard instructor versus soft, to what extent was attrition factored into your analysis? In other words, does the upward second year performance take into account the abject failure of those who dropped out after <laughs> second year <laughs> because of poor performance with a hard Great instructor? Part. And I wonder if you could do this on Lehigh's <laughs> professors who were really hard too. Hey, I, I, we're going to have a meeting with the pro. I mean, yes, I mean, the, I, would, I want to do this, right? I want to do this systematically. The challenge with Lehigh, of course, is that it's not random. People choose uh -huh. their instructors. Everyone and their mother, of course, wants to go have Frank as the instructor, right? As you know. Uh, and so, you know, as a result, it's really it's going to be really hard to pull that out. Whereas mm -hmm. the, the Naval Academy, there's no choice. And also to the to the question, uh, those who actually outright fail are just not part of the system. So we really just looking at those who have to do the two core sequence. Uh, so the abject failures, Godspeed. I don't. We don't really. We don't really. We don't really know. But I think to the to the point. Yes, we think that this is an approach. We can do lot more creative things in terms. Of, yeah, we don't have the randomness at Lehigh. We mm -hmm. have other things that we can explore to try to understand these 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 instructor effects. If they will allow me to do the research, I will be happy to do the research. I feel like I just saw something on that that Nathan Urban presented about the retention for students. Um, so there right. might be something going on. No, that's right. And this also yeah. relates to how we do grades at, at, yeah. at the university, what the signals we try to, how much encouragement we should provide mm -hmm. to students, how much, um, you know, something stronger than encouragement we should provide yeah. our students. These are yeah. all part of this. Uh, Sean's question is, it, this was a very exciting look into your process for data collection and analysis, but have you deduced any empirical results from this experiment and how can they be applied to your overall goal for this project? Yeah, no, great. So yeah, just for the interest of this discussion, I'm not, I didn't show any empirical uh, estimates. Uh, you know, one thing I, I might mention the one, oh, I'll do it right here since we're in the Q&A. So I talked about retention, right? And what we did was uh, look at this analysis from 70 years of data, going back to 1870 to 1940, and we're looking at pay, okay? So we have this, uh, you know, along, we have all the pay, we saw that table of pay. And it turns out that money isn't everything, but money helps, <laughs> money helps a lot. And when I present this work, and I presented some some aspect of this to the, to the, to the Ministry of Defense, using the Royal Navy, this is for the US Navy, but the Royal Navy has a similar kind of thing. Uh, some were a little incredulous. They, you know, how, why would pay matter? Military service is all about, you know, fidelity to the nation, patriotism. Well, uh, money is not going to really do it. And so we said, ah, money, money, you know, and, and again, Groucho Marx has a great quote, money isn't everything, but money allows you to avoid things you dislike. Since I dislike almost everything, money is useful. <laughs> and here officers find great use in money. Uh, and in fact, they uh, retain themselves with real crazy persistence. This 0.6 to 0.9 elasticity of separation is exactly what people find in the 20th century context. Hmm. So this is like our, our kind of shout out to say, I know military is different, but it's not that different. And that's where we can actually learn quite a bit. So right. well, here we go. You wanted to estimate, this is like an, an explicit estimate that I want to I, I, I do that. Yeah. Um, Brian says, what's the biggest challenge to this kind of big data research? External validity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something called internal validity, which I guess I talked a lot about, which do you see the effect? Is the effect what you're saying it is? Is it causal, not correlated? Mm -hmm. And that's where all those random things that are happening in the military mm -hmm. helps with the causal. The challenge is the external validity, which is once we have this causal understanding, can we learn from it in other contexts? Mm. And again, uh, a lot of deep research uh, points to the fact that, yes, you can, but you have to be a little careful, right? You can't take the lessons of the military and apply them wholesale into the, into the civilian world. But many things you can, and it's up to us to articulate what are the things you can, what are the things you can't, and, and you know, tell the audience, tell our reviewer, tell our referee writers that, indeed, uh, this is um, valid from an external perspective, because that's really what we're going for here. It's sort of learning how to do business better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it is one o'clock and um, or 1300 hours, right? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, you don't have to do that. I left because of this. I don't need that. <laughs> well, I'm about to become a military mom, so I got to get used to this. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so we do have to go. I'm sorry to the few questions that we did not get to, um, but Ahmed did put his email there. And in addition to uh, the hate mail that you <laughs> that he's looking forward to, you can also just send him questions um, to ask any further and ask more about the data. I'm sure you seem like you're um, really enthusiastic about it and that you'd be happy to share. I'm more. very happy to share uh, any and all discussions. And uh, hate, love, it doesn't really matter. In all, I'm serious. Please send, send, send away. No, it. it's fascinating. It's a really interesting take on, and I'm sure that the people who are in your data sets are probably happy that their careers are mattering. <laughs> you know, this, this Except for that John future. guy that I picked on as right. a, a non-leader. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, um, thank you everybody for attending. And um, we will see you soon, I hope. Bye-bye.